Hi, it's me, Jillian Greystoke, and I'm starting to wonder if I'm ever going to feel happiness again. Because I have another book that has filled me with rage. Maybe I only feel rage now. Maybe I'm just a rage, am I just a rage person, Nigel? Fortunately for all of you, I hated this book for very different reasons than I hated the last one, so at least there's variety. Isn't that right, buddy? I decided that I didn't like that my lips were invisible, so my black lipstick was right next to me. And besides, uh, Nigel is here, my black cat. I have some sort of slightly visible skull-shaped lights on my bookcase, and uh, this book is vaguely horror-esque. It's really more of a thriller, but Yes, this should give you an idea of how this review is going to go because it's mostly just going to be rage. Although I did actually do some research from actual, like, first-hand sources for this one. Now I'm warning you here, and I warned you in the title of this, that I'm going to be spoiling this book. And this book relies heavily and basically only on the sole gimmick of confusing the reader, so Everybody will tell you to go into this one blind, including the blurb. The blurb basically tells you to go in blind, and that's because if you know what's going to happen in any way, uh, it's going to ruin the book because, like I said, it has one gimmick, and that is your confusion. It was recommended to me. I was uh, feeling really bummed about my reading experience with the Atlas Six, and I was like, everybody, please recommend me my next favorite book. And a friend of mine has been recommending this book to me like multiple times. She was always like, you need to read this book. You're gonna love it. I know you love thrillers. I know you love kind of creepy things. Like, please read this. There's a cat in it. She sold it to me that there was a cat in it, and, they, and she said that it was a well-done cat. So I was like, Okay, because some of you may know that I have written a cat character in my book Boots, which has also been praised as a very well done cat character. So I'm like, okay, I want to see, I want to see this author's version. Everyone's like, go in blind, go in blind, but they love it. They love it. This book is so popular. So I'm like, okay, I'm in for a treat. I'm probably gonna find my next favorite read, but let's let's now read the blurb. This is the story of a serial killer, a stolen child, revenge, death, and an ordinary house at the end of an ordinary street. All these things are true, and yet they are all lies. I mean, this book does rely a lot on lying to you. You think you know what's inside the last house on Needless Street. You think you've read this story before, but that's where you're wrong. In a dark forest at the end of Needless Street lies something buried, but it's not what you think. No, it's exactly what you think. Um, yeah. Um, I like went into this knowing that there was going to be unreliable narrator and it's pretty obvious right away that we have an unreliable narrator and I was like okay I'm gonna have to be really paying attention and puzzle this out and I guessed basically the exact ending except for one very stupid thing that we'll talk about later I guessed everything and I spent the entire book talking myself out of my initial guess being like no it can't be that it can't be that it can't be that only to come back and find out that I was right in like the first chapter of the book. But that that wasn't my biggest problem with this book. And and like I I don't feel like I figured it out because this author was so clever and laid out all of these clues for me. I figured it out because I know the tropes and I'm an author, so my brain just went what would be like the twist of this. Uh, and you'll notice on Goodreads, I needed to go read other people's reviews of this after I read this book. And the other low star reviewers on Goodreads also guessed this book in the first few chapters. So I'm not the cleverest of clever boots out there that figured it out. People are figuring it out and then they're disappointed when they get there. So um, I'm gonna kind of try to run through this. Maybe I'll go maybe more in order of events versus like characters and plot and world building because they all kind of mesh together. And then I will get to the thing that like had me at a low simmering rage the entire time I was reading. Do you ever have those experiences where you feel like you should be liking a book but you can't and that is only adding to your rage? This feeling that like everybody else is getting something that I'm not getting and maybe I'm the incorrect one, but then I'm like, no, the things I'm mad about seem pretty justifiable to be mad about. Because I think this book is actively harmful and is not what it is trying to be at all. So the book follows Ted, and I am going to spoil this immediately. Ted has Dissociative Identity Disorder, and that is a twist for the end. The other characters include Ted's cat and Ted's daughter, who are both members of the system. They are both alters, 
as well as a younger version of himself and an, and an adult version of himself. He has boarded himself away in a house at the end of Needless Street, where he lives a like shadowy half-life, barely scraping through his existence, hiding some criminal activity that his evil mother had done in the past. Meanwhile, there's the backdrop of there a little girl went missing many, many years ago, girl with popsicle, went missing, and Ted was one of the suspects, and I can't even really remember why he was a suspect, but he was one of the suspects, so he was in the newspaper, and so the sister of the little girl who went missing shows up, she gets a point of view, she shows up a little way into the books, so we don't get her point of view right away, and she is seeking the one who kidnapped her sister, although that is one of the most infuriating plot points. Maybe not gonna get to that right away. I don't know, I'm trying to structure this because it is a mess. First thing you will notice is that this book is incredibly slow paced and it is incredibly vague and it is kind of like confusing. The writing style is all short choppy sentences all short choppy sentences all the way through. And that is one of my least favorite writing styles, but I could have survived it if there had been other things about this book that I liked, but there weren't. So we have Ted, who initially we are setting up to be a sympathetic dad whose daughter has some kind of psychological thing going on and she like attacks him and hits him and he's just trying to be a good dad. And also he has a cat with whom he has a very close connection and they hang out together. So the first thing that I notice is that the cat does not actually act like a cat. Like there are some cat-like things that it does, but also the cat is a Christian and in my opinion, that is never justified. Why is the cat a Christian? That seemed, that immediately hit me as like, oh, this is not a real cat, because being a Christian is the least cat-like thing I can think of anybody ever writing. If cats worship anyone, they worship themselves, and that's all there is to it. So that was my first clue. The second clue is that the cat had an understanding of human things. It, it described something once in like extremely human terms in a way that it would have no context for because the object that it used to describe things was not even in the house. So it would have no context for this. Yeah, and like Ted is displayed as a you know, as a man who loves animals and very kind to animals. So when you start hearing a little bit of his backstory and it seems like he was actually killing animals as a child, you're it's supposed to confuse you, but I'm like, oh no, I know what's going on here. It's very obvious to me, I don't know. But a lot of this book exists to confuse you. If you are confused while reading this book, it is doing what it intended. Except I was listening pretty carefully and I was not confused, I was annoyed because the book felt like it was constantly winking at me and the book clearly thought that it was very clever pulling one over on me and I'm sitting there going, but you're not though. Seemed extremely obvious to me very early on that this was a case of DID and all of these characters, except for the Ted's therapist and the girl who's seeking her sister are his alters and he just has no idea so that he has DID or what's going on because like Ted has never talked to another human being except for his therapist like in his life. He's his mother and his quote-unquote therapist and the lady down the street who has a dachshund. End of list of people Ted has ever spoken to. That's one of the things that I think uh, graded on me. One of the many things about mental illness that graded on me in this story is that Ted uh, is so separated and so like reclusive and it definitely seems like a lot of the book is saying that if you have a disability you kind of just don't belong in society. Now the ending gives it a nice glossy sheen, and we'll talk about that, but like initially it was very much like, isn't he weird? What a weirdo. Isn't he strange? He can't get along in regular society. How strange is Ted and his, and his weird daughter with whatever she has going on? The daughter alter is one of the more like destructive alters. Two people I know personally in my life who have DID, I ask them to make sure that some of the things in this book were accurate and pro possibly at the end we'll kind of go over maybe what those things are a little bit. I will say that the author did get like a majority majority of things correct, they use the correct terminology, and for the most part, they got a lot of aspects correct. And my understanding is the author was really patting herself on the back for all of that, just really like wants all of the kudos for not fucking up 
this character with DID because, oh, he's, it turns out that he's the hero of the story and it turns out that he's not the murderer. Oh, didn't I do good? Except for she still treated this character like garbage and used his diagnosis as the central plot twist of the book. It's not just a plot twist. It is the whole plot twist of the book. And mental illness and DID needs to stop being used as a plot twist for your thrillers. And that's what made me so mad is when I figured it out, and I knew that it was going to be the central plot twist, the big rug pull at the end of the story, I was enraged. And I don't even have DID, but I know people who do. And to see a book come so close to respectfully addressing DID and then still use it as the big main twist of the entire book, just made me so angry. People with DID deserve to have books where they just get to be people. And I'm trying to use the correct language here because I am still learning and I'm learning every day about DID. So if I do use any language that is incorrect, please do correct me in the comments because I do want to learn. And do share, if you are comfortable, do share your DID experiences below. But this book really, really bothered me on a fundamental level. And so many people were praising it, being like, oh, it's such a respectful portrayal of DID. And I'm like, no, it's not respectful. He's treated like a social pariah the entire book, a miserable social pariah the entire book. And then at the end, the surprise is that he has DID. And I am so angry, <laughs> possibly unreasonably angry. Like I was just fuming while I was listening to this at work. So the whole time the book is trying to trick you into thinking that Ted is the kidnapper and his daughter Lauren is the kidnapped girl who he keeps in a freezer, like a freezer that he's drilled air holes into. But like there's all these like gaps. Ted has a lot of gaps in his memory, sometimes when another altar is fronting, and sometimes because he is also very, very conveniently taking uh, old medication because another twist it turns out that his psychologist whatever is actually just a money-hungry weirdo who's trying to use Ted to write a book about Ted and so he's just giving Ted paper bags full of old drugs so if anything in this book is like questionable and you're like well what about that scene the author can just hand wave it away like oh that was a result of Ted taking those old medications that really fucked him up especially since he sometimes takes them with alcohol so it's very convenient that anything that doesn't make any goddamn sense when you get to the end of the book, it was just the bad drugs and the fact that Ted has DID. So not only is Ted a total recluse who doesn't know how to socialize, but his therapist, quote unquote, turns out to be an evil man who is giving Ted bad drugs, which I feel like also sends bad messages about like therapy and psychology and medication. Now, the argument could be made that the author was trying to say something about how difficult it can be to find the right therapist for you, to find the right medical professional for you. There are people out there who are not going to be a good fit for you, who will be dismissive, and it can be really challenging out there for people with mental illness, especially if they're on their own, to find the right person to help them. However, I don't think that's what this author was doing. I think that the author just wanted to have, A, an excuse for Ted to conveniently mix up things and not remember things because of the drugs whenever we needed to for the plot and also to have another plot twist where Ted's therapist turned out to be an evil man. So that's not great, but that's not the worst of this book's sins in my opinion. So Ted has gotten like no help whatsoever and just like spends all his time locked away in a house with boards over the windows, which is also the same house that is his like inner world. I forget, is there a name for like the inner world? I know some people, people with DID have like different spaces where all their altars like hang out and sometimes castles and sometimes like a really cozy room like Ted and Ted's is the house. So sometimes we don't, we don't even know sometimes, the reader doesn't even know when he's actually just out and about in the house or when we're inside of his mind, inside of the version of the house that's in his mind. And, and all that serves to be confusing for the reader because confusing the reader so we can get to the big twist at the end is this book's number one and only gimmick. So eventually one of his alters convinces his other alter that Ted is an evil kidnapper. So 
Lauren, the, the daughter one, convinces the cat that Ted is a kidnapper who has imprisoned her and the cat needs to help the daughter kill Ted. And interestingly enough, like the cat almost has an alter her own self. I kind of forgot to ask if this is a thing, if alters can have alters. Because the cat has like a separate version of herself that is like a nighttime cat. And so like, I think we were supposed to be getting a hint about DID through the cat because during the day she's a sweet, gentle cat and at night she can become like the hunter and the hunter is the one who like catches mice and stuff, which it's also heavily implied that Ted catches and eats rodents in the form of his cat self. Man, I should have asked about that too. Who? okay, maybe I should, maybe I should ask another question here. All right, the question is out to one of my sources for DID, so let's see if I get a response. But I didn't even think about that until now, doing this review, that it is implied that Ted, like, eats raw mice. All right, my source has responded. They say that it is technically possible that a if an animal alter is fronting, that something like that could happen. However, they are disgusted that a person who does not have DID and has not actually experienced this would write that. Like, if it was someone with DID writing about their actual lived experiences, okay. But the person who wrote this book, I researched this, does not have DID. They have done some research about DID, that much is clear, but they do not have it. So my source is absolutely disgusted that they would write that. So do with that information what you will. The book was definitely very vague about where Ted gets money and how he feeds the body essentially because it's implied that he sells things in the house but at the same time that is not gonna get him enough money to survive so I'm just kind of realizing that he catches and eats raw rodents because the other characters will wake up the night after the cat has gone hunting and say that like their mouth tastes terrible and stuff like that and I'm just now realizing holy shit this author wrote that they eat raw mice. Maybe don't write that unless that is something that you have specifically experienced yourself. Maybe that's one of those things. Anyway, I'm, mm, I'm trying to process that realization that I just had and carry on with the review and I'm really struggling. Yeah, my source just kind of backed it up and said, um, it is accurate sometimes for alters to try to eat weird things, but to use it for like a gross creepy factor is not okay. Now this is the opinion of one source, so not everybody's gonna agree with this, obviously, and I highly recommend, if you don't have DID, that you speak to some people who do on this subject, because they're gonna know better than you. Anyway, okay, what was I talking about? There's so many things, but the, the main thing that filled me with rage, very obviously, is the treatment of DID, even though the author did get many things correct, and I checked this with my, both of my sources, did get many things correct. Still, using it for shock factor and using it as the main twist of the book are not okay. So Ted goes through most of this book just completely struggling, and in the end, um, one of his alters convinces the other one to help her stab the body. So Ted goes out into the woods to stab uh, themselves, I guess. The, the altar takes Ted into the woods to stab the body. Meanwhile, the girl who has been like watching Ted, cause she moved into the house across the street, an old decrepit house across the street, because she thinks, we'll get into that, that Ted is the one who kidnapped her sister. And like, she thinks that Ted is keeping her sister in, in the house and in the chest freezer with holes in the top. So she follows Ted out into the woods and sees Ted stab themselves and tries to help, to help the process along, but Ted just won't die. And then the, she just wanders D, her name is D, and then D, thinking that she has done the job, wanders off into the woods, is bitten by a snake and dies. What the fuck? And like there's this whole motif with her and snakes that was throughout her, her characterization is that she's terrified of snakes because we are told in her first person narration that when she was a child, she went swimming in a lake on the day that her sister went missing and a bunch of water snakes attacked her. And so now she's terrified of snakes. But it turns out 
And this is also enraging because this is one of my least favorite tropes and there's no excuse for this. It turns out that D was lying to herself and the reader in first person point of view because it needed to be a twist. And it was the dumbest twist ever. So it turns out that there were no snakes. That the day that Dee's sister was quote unquote kidnapped, Dee and her sister were at the lakeside with their parents at the beach and Dee was trying to ditch her little sister but her little sister came along and Dee wanted to go make out with a boy. So she and this boy were making out and the little sister fell on some rocks, cracked her head open and died. And Dee freaked out and ran away first, but then she was like, no, I think I can help and ran back. But when she ran back, her sister's body was gone and she didn't know what happened to it. And so she just decided as like a 13 year old girl that she was gonna play along with that her sister was kidnapped. So she told us that that's what happened through the book. In her own head, in her own first person point of view, she straight up lied to the reader for no good reason. And they try to kind of brush it off like, well, it was because she had like convinced herself of the other memory and I'm like, no, this is the laziest thing. It's so lazy and I hate it in thrillers. So often you have first person point of view. I'll even be a little bit more forgiving of it if it's in third person limited, although not much more, but it's always first person point of view and the character straight up lies to the reader in the character's own head for no reason other than the twist because it's always such a cop-out. It's like, you know that scene that I told you about before? Actually, it wasn't true. The character just decided to think that it was true in that moment so that it was a surprise for you later when it wasn't true. So why did she get bitten by the snake at the end? It was so stupid. She made up the story about the snakes attacking her, but she's afraid of snakes through the whole thing. I think she like saw a snake on the day that her sister was taken, but then she gets bitten by a fucking snake at the end of the book, wanders off into the woods and dies. Because I guess the author didn't know what to do with that loose end. Like, it couldn't be that she found Ted and realized that she was wrong because her memories were incorrect and like helped Ted or anything like that. No, no, Ted has to be helped by the most deus ex machina thing I have ever seen, where a hunky park ranger just happens to also be in the woods at night with his bloodhound he happens to have, and the bloodhound scented, even though it's a pet bloodhound, it scented Ted's blood, sniffed him out, and the hunky park ranger saves Ted, and then Ted gets a free boyfriend, and everything's okay. Because Ted is gay. Uh, the cat is a lesbian, which I think is supposed to be our first hint that Ted is gay, and I'm like, I don't even know what to do about that, but Okay, so Ted gets a free hunky boyfriend that like heroically carried him out of the woods. And then the boyfriend is like, oh, these are old drugs. You shouldn't be taking these. Like, who's your psychologist? And the boyfriend like identifies right away that, that Ted has DID and what's going on. And the boyfriend is just like immediately the perfect boyfriend who is completely understanding and loving and caring and amazing. Just so we can get to the end of this book and Ted can get like a happy ending just kind of plopped in his lap because the author wants us to know that she has written um, a not villainous DID character and it's like that is the lowest possible bar. You're like, did you trip stepping over that bar? Because I would think it would be pretty difficult to do that. I knew that Ted wasn't the kidnapper. I immediately knew because we keep hearing about Ted's mother, who was an immigrant by the way, who was clearly um, abusive and evil. One of the first memories we get from Ted about his mother was she bought him a little carved kitty because he wanted a pet kitty, but his mother believed that keeping pets, she, she must be a member of PETA, she believed that keeping pets was inhumane. She bought him a little carved kitty one day when they were at the beach and he loved that thing with his whole heart. But then on the way home, his mother dragged him out of the car and made him leave the kitty in the woods to teach him that everything you love will leave you. And I'm like, oh, well the mother's clearly their actual villain. And it turned out to be true. And you even find out that the mother's father was a psychopath who murdered people in the little French village that they came from. She was gaslighting Ted into believing that he was a psychopath. And then she was killing children from the children's hospital where she worked. And she killed the animals that 
uh, she gaslit Ted into believing that he had killed. And so, like, but I figured that all out. Like, immediately, I was like, oh, Ted's not the murderer, it's his psychopathic mom. So the, the thing that's hilarious to me is I'm seeing all these people saying, well, the author was so proud. There's apparently an author's note that is in one of the print versions of the book that I didn't get because I listened to the audiobook. And I tried to find the author's note online and I couldn't find it, at least in my Google searching. Maybe it's out there somewhere. But the author was very proud that the mentally ill person was not the villain, except you just made a different mentally ill person the villain because his mom is a psychopath, <laughs> an undiagnosed, unmedicated psychopath whose father was also a psychopath, she straight up tells you. So, you didn't. You, di you didn't do the thing that you, you were so proud that you did. You just moved it to a different character. So yeah, the character with DID doesn't turn out to be the murderer, and yes, we really need more stories like that because it's really getting tired and old that every time we hear about a character with DID, one of their alters is, is a murder one. Because that's not, that's not a thing. That's a harmful stereotype that needs to stop happening. So I'm glad that we didn't have that, but you don't get any pats on the back for not having a like blatant lie in your story. And instead, just having the person with DID still be the plot twist and having a different mentally ill character be the murderer. The way that Ted's story and Dee's story are linked are so tangential because it turns out, another crazy random happenstance, similar to Ted's hunky boyfriend showing up in the woods, it turns out that when Dee's little sister fell and hit her head and Dee ran away the first time, that it just so happened that Ted's mother was in the woods and she grabbed up the little girl's body to, I don't know, do evil medical experiments on. She was an evil medical person. She liked to experiment on children, including Ted, you know, because he's got all the trauma. Very, very tangentially, Dee's story is still connected with Ted's story, but it's just a lot of, a lot of circumstance going on there that it just so happened that when the little girl fell in, in the water, Ted's mother was right there just waiting to scoop up free corpse. Free corpse! Like, isn't it great? You just, you're, you're having a nice day by the lake and you find a free corpse. <sighs> okay, so I had a bunch of questions coming off of this book to ask my sources and I'm gonna kind of like look through them and see if there's anything that I haven't touched on to make sure. The author did get a lot of things right. I do want to emphasize that the author did get a lot of things right and some nuanced things that I didn't even think were true, which my sources confirmed were true, that the author got correct. So I don't want to diminish that the author did get many more things correct than a lot of people get right when they're writing DID, but that does not, in my mind, negate that they still used it as a horror book, thriller book gimmick. So immediately I wondered, and I thought that it probably could be if an altar could be an animal, and yes, an altar 100% can be an animal, they can also be fictional characters. That is correct, Ted could have a cat altar, or two, technically, because the cat kind of has her own altar in the form of the hunter cat. Its name is Nighttime, and it is like one of the more protective um, of his altars. Yes, certain altars can hurt the body or attempt to hurt the body. They can be suicidal. They can coerce other altars into harming the body. So all of that stuff is true, at least according to my sources. Again, I have two sources, but they are both in agreement about this. Resentment can build up within a system. Altars can have disagreements with each other and they can like attack each other or hurt each other in a way, so that is also true. They can deceive each other, they can plot with each other to do things like what happened with Ted, where one of his alters convinced another to stab the body. One thing that did come up that both of my sources were like, mm, not quite on, is that one of them was very much no, and one of them was like, not quite, um, is that one of Ted's alters has decided to take on all of the pain from the body. And so when Ted is fronting, he cannot feel pain at all. One of my sources was like, well, alters can like, numb the pain or like mute it a little bit. And if that altar is fronting, then yes, they can take on the pain. 
but like an altar cannot choose to take all physical pain in such a way that whoever is fronting feels no pain whatsoever. That's not actually a real thing according to my two sources. And the last question that both of my sources agree is not a thing is that Ted seems to actually believe that Lauren, his daughter, is physically with him in the world. Like he seems to hallucinate that she is actually with him in the world. At one point he takes her clothing shopping and he, as Ted, seems to be fronting and seems to believe that he is shopping with his actual daughter and is trying to purchase her clothing. But in reality, what the employees of the store are seeing is a large grown man attempting to buy child-sized leggings by himself. And that is inaccurate. Uh, from both of my sources, again, I only have two sources, but both of them agree that you do not hallucinate that your altars are real people, they're standing next to you in the real world, which seemed like Ted sometimes did. Not all the time, but sometimes. Part of it was that we had a lot of confusion about when we were in the house or the house inside of the, the inner space. The inner space was also the same house. So it was very confusing, intentionally confusing, when we were where. It seemed pretty clear to me that Ted did go out to an actual store in the real world in an attempt to purchase leggings for the daughter that he thought was actually physically next to him. Now maybe I'm wrong, but if I am, I'm gonna say that it was probably poor writing or intentionally confusing writing. The writing was meant to be confusing at that point, so it definitely seemed like that was what it was saying. Maybe other people got something else from that, but that seemed like what it was saying to me. And it seemed like that was true in other situations where Ted believed that the cat was there with him in the real world. Not great. All right, I need to stop ranting about this, but like I am uh, so upset about this book. Like, reading it was an upsetting experience, and I don't even have DID. I, if you have DID, I would not recommend this book. I feel like it will be very traumatizing, it will be a very negative experience for you. Personally, again, as someone without DID, I don't think it's a good representation. Yes, 100% it is better than the representations that are pretty prominent out there, but that's because those representations are garbage, and a little bit better than garbage. Like, this one is sitting on top of the garbage can, but it's still on the garbage can. All right, that was my very vehement opinion of this book. Um, I'm gonna stop now <laughs> because my rage cannot be contained, but um, I, one of my sources is someone with DID who is writing a book about a character who just has DID and is going on a fantasy adventure separate from the fact that they have DID. And I, I really hope that uh, if you're listening that you finish that book because I really want to read it. I want to read it. I want to see it. I hope that you are able to finish it because like we need books like that written about characters who have DID by people who have DID who can share the experiences as like a part of life versus as a plot twist in a thriller. If you stuck around after this rant uh, and you liked this and didn't like immediately close out and be like, what a social justice warrior, bye, then please uh, know that you can support me over on Patreon and also on Ko-fi if you'd like to leave me a one-time tip. I also have a Fiverr where I am a developmental editor, so I will not lie to you if I feel like your book is giving me the ick and I will try to help you find things like sensitivity readers because I have connections with some sensitivity readers. I will help you try to find those things so that your book can be the best it can be and not accidentally be deeply insulting. That's uh, that's really a small thing to ask for from us authors and yet and yet. All right, I'm going to shut up now. I will see you again next time with whatever it is I happen to be doing next time. Bye!